Hi, this is Paula from CHE. We're back with our segment with K. Breton Council MP Mike Kellaway, where we bring him questions from the community. Today we talk about the end of the Canada Emergency Response Benefit and changes to EI to help seasonal workers. Later in the segment, we also talk about seniors and pensions. Here's our conversation. As I understand, by the end of September, CERB is going to be discontinued and people are going to be put on EI. But my question was about people who regularly, usually in a regular year, we get EI, but they might not qualify this year because they don't have enough hours, like people in tourism. Would they be accepted into EI this year? Well, that's a great question, Paula. And uh, another one, our office has been working closely with Ottawa on giving our um, giving our workforce. Uh, when you look at our workforce, it's highly um, directed towards the seasonal. And so we're of the understanding, myself and my office, in, in, in working with Employment Services Canada, which is the primary department, Employment Services Development Canada, uh, is that uh, we should be hearing an announcement soon around nuances and changes that will be made to EI that will have what we've been told a, a very significant impact on seasonal workers. So you're absolutely right. Uh, looks to be that serve the sunset income October 3rd. Uh, so um, the EI changes uh, in, in terms of seasonal workers will have to be announced in my opinion before then. We've been told, and again, I always like to be up, upfront and honest when the, the conversations that I'm having with Ottawa is that um, the people that we talked to said, Mike, we know that you have a lot of seasonal workers in Cape Breton County, so we believe you're going to like some of the changes that have been made. And I said, "Can you tell me what they are?" They said, "No, it's capped to confidentiality." And okay, I said, "Okay, can you tell me what they are?" Uh, I tried it three or four times, uh, but we've been pushing that, um, just given the fact that it is an unusual year, to say the least, the understatement of the year. Uh, but Paula, I think too, I think we can go out on a limb to say it's going to be an unusual year again. Now, will it mirror? This past year, uh, it certainly won't be the same year as two years ago, right? Because we, we're, we're, we're anticipating a second wave. What does that look like? Has it been mitigated? Uh, uh, how does that impact um, uh, seasonal jobs going into the fall, into the winter, and back into the summer again? So um, we're anticipating, uh, and I hopefully when we have our next call with you, to be able to go over what has been presented to Canadians. The Prime Minister uh, made some overtures to some changes that are being made to EI. But the bottom line is this. Um, you know, Canadians are hurting. They have been hurting. Uh, but they will continue to hurt if we do not have that safety net in place uh, that will replace CERB. Uh, and so, or uh, be a conduit for CERB. And so that's where EI is going to come in or changes to EI. And we've, you know, I can tell you what we've put forward. I mean, we, we've put forward some substantial documents uh, to Minister Paltro, Minister uh, Morneau, and the Prime Minister's office around uh, the importance to recognize that this year, in terms of seasonal work, we cannot truly base EI on this year simply because it's been a year that has been cut short in some cases to a large degree for seasonal workers and we've been uh, pushing that so every week we call um, just to kind of get an update on what what is happening the last call we had was last week and so I'm hoping for um, some good news um, this month on that. And I think the, uh, the Prime Minister kind of provided a bit of foreshadowing to that last week with, uh, I think, just a general statement uh, with respect to, to EI. But again, I would put this under the category of, uh, in our writing, as one of the top, top three issues top four issues uh, and because it you know it's not just uh, it's not just tourism although that's a big part of it there's other industries that uh, rely on, on on seasonal work and if you don't have the amount of weeks and CERB is not going to continue uh, we need to have that safety net I'm very confident we will uh, so um, I, that's my update at this moment is that I'm anticipating and expecting uh, some substantial changes uh, to, to EI to ensure that seasonal workers are looked after. Not just now, but I think we need to look, we're at a point, I think, in, 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 in the evolution of this pandemic, that we need to look um, a year or two down the road, in my opinion. And here's why. I mean, last night, um, you know, I was watching uh, Dr. Tam speak about, uh, you know, somebody asked the question, 
will social distancing, you know, be another six months, six days, six weeks? And her answer was a very honest one. It's probably a year or two of this. Um, and so, you know, the world, when people say the world has changed, it hasn't changed for the, for the, for just for the past six months, it's going to change, uh, and evolve as, as we go. And so do the policies that we enact need to evolve and change. Think about it. Um, in April, late April, early May announcement was made by the government. Just take the wage subsidy for an example, for your, for your viewers. We initially said we would offer 25, um, uh, it was a 25% subsidy for, towards uh, wage subsidy. And then MPs like myself and those across this country said, you know, we need more. We need substantially more. And cabinet was listening. We made that change. And then it was extended to um, August. And now it's extended to December. And what I think you'll see, Paul, and again, for your listeners, I, I, I don't want them to think that, uh, you know, I want them to know that these are my, these are my assertions and assumptions here. But I think that when you look at the wage subsidy, the wage subsidy, along with the changes to EI that are to come, are going to be two fundamental pillars of policy to, to ensure that workers uh, either stay at work, that those that can, or those that get back to work, that those that can. And then, of course, the changes to the seasonal EI and EI in general. So this is really important. This is, you know, essentially, this is part of the restart the economy program uh, that, uh, the, that the Prime Minister announced last week with respect to health and I think it was 19 billion going to, uh, to the provinces around everything from child care to PPE to uh, contact tracing. So all of this is done with purpose and meaning and um, I like to think that um, like, like communities like Shetty Camp and Arishad and Pomcat, uh, which I hope to come soon for a, for a very important announcement for Pomcat, um, I like to think that character uh, shines through through crisis, and we've seen that in our riding, in our people, our businesses, our not for profits, and I think we've seen that at different levels, all levels of government. So, much to do, uh, much is happening, but it's all part of a puzzle, and there's not one solution to this. But, um, but um, nevertheless, uh, more to do and more to come. By the way, uh, in the fall, in terms of announcements that are going to be looking at investments in municipalities. Um, um, Minister McKenna brought that up yesterday around the changes to the bilateral agreement. That's going to be significant to uh, Victoria County and Inverness County and Inaganesh and Guysboro and the CBRM and, and Richmond counties. Um, and uh, we're kind of working, um, we're working, you wouldn't know I, uh, I'm in my office working with this Hawaiian shirt on, but I am uh, around things such as infrastructure and things such as uh, um, the item that you originally talked about in terms of your question, uh, changes to EI. Just kind of going back a little bit, you said that EI was top three or top four. What other priorities do you have? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, I think um, if you look at um, one of the things I just mentioned around the wage subsidy, uh, you know, I am a firm believer that this wage subsidy is uh, an investment, not a spend. And so when I look at um, the wage subsidy, um, I'm looking um, as an MP, and I am advocating beyond January, uh, beyond December, uh, when it's supposed to conclude. Uh, why? Uh, constituents loud and clear from Canso to Shady Camp to Glace Bay to Manadu have, have told me their businesses. We, we, we had the Minister of Small Business in the riding on, um, on uh, Monday, uh, virtually. I had her on a tablet going to business to business around, around parts of my riding. And we talked to uh, restaurant owners. And they said, without the wage subsidy, uh, they wouldn't have been able to open. Without the rental program, the rent program, Canada rent program, it would have been difficult for them to maintain being open. So I look at it from a multiple perspective. So if I looked at, I mentioned around, um, you know, the priority that we, we, we talked about uh, as number three or number four, um, it's probably not even best to categorize it, but I say the top tier is around health, of course. Uh, number two, 
uh, and I'm, I'm not even going to, I, I, I break my own rule. I'm giving numbers. Um, the top, I would say the wage subsidy, ensuring people have jobs to go to, ensuring that businesses can stay open. Uh, the seasonal workers, as I mentioned, critical. Um, also uh, providing opportunities for youth. Sometimes that gets lost in the shuffle, sadly, and, and, but not in my mind. Um, a huge one, Paula, uh, and I joined, uh, and I asked to join this committee last week, and we're actually making a presentation today to a couple of ministers, is around not-for-profits. So if you're a not-for-profit, and there are many in our writing, and many across our country, that contribute not just back to providing uh, programming to community, but also contribute to the bottom line. You're, you know, you've had six, seven months now you know, yeah, six, seven months of not being able to fundraise like you used to, to be able to pay for the pay for the oil, pay for the lights. But these are community hubs. These are what they call in the big cities, innovation hubs, in my opinion. The, you know, the seniors organization and Grand Atang provides just as much value to community spirit and assisting in community capacity than um, an organization in downtown Toronto. We need them. We're going to need them more through this pandemic. So I've asked to sit on this committee on, on, on making a pitch for a strategy to assist not-for-profits, not six months down the road, but now. And so what, you know, what keeps me up at night um, is the, the not-for-profits as well, the charities, the organizations, the community halls. And you know, if you don't live in a small community like us, you may say, well, that's just a community hall. They have bean suppers and that's that. No, no, they are, they are the community. They provide services. They provide, in some cases, hope, shelter, assistance. They're, they're critical to us, critical. And so what I'd like to see is more, uh, a hell of a lot more focus right now on ensuring that not that, that not that you just have money for programming, but what I'm hearing loud and clear and the research that I've done from other communities in other parts of this country, whether it's the YMCAs or community halls, is programming money is important. Operations is even more important because you can't do the programs if you can't open the building. So um, I'm doing a full core press later today um, meeting with, there's a handful of MPs meeting with the, uh, the minister as part of this coalition to look at um, what can the federal government do to be innovative, to, to assist these organizations that go from coast to coast to coast to, um, to, to stay open, whether that's bridge loans, br bridge non-repayable loans rather, uh, to, to maintain um, to maintain the services and, and open the building. And there's a few others that I've put together uh, based on conversations with people in our constituency, people in Shreddicamp, people in Glace Bay, people in uh, Manadou and Namadam and Guysboro. Uh, so that's another one that's uh, very, very important to me. Seniors is another. Um, so we you know we we've we've managed to to uh, get out a fair amount of money out the door uh, nationwide for seniors that are on uh, old age security and GIS, um, which is great. But we also now, as I say to everybody that I talk to, and whether it's Zoom or six feet apart, we also need to think about a year and two down the road. So we need to think long term around seniors. We need to think long term, long term around the long term health care. Um, and if anybody read the report by the Canadian Armed Forces with respect to what they saw in Ontario in terms of long term health care, it's an embarrassment, it's a tragedy, and we're better than that. So those are the things that we need to double down on, not just in investments, but having a conversation first, not a study. Not a study, but action. And uh, those are the things that certainly, and then there's, uh, Paula, then there's individual, you know, individual cases that um, are, are quite substantial that come through our office. And uh, uh, so you're dealing with that. You're dealing with the micro, which is important, and the macro that's important. You're dealing in the six months, but also you're trying to prognosticate, at least our offices and our work, 
trying to look at a year or two down the road because as quick as the fishing season has concluded, before you know it, we're gonna be talking about what? The, the next fishing season. So these are important measures. Every measure we put out is important to triage the patient. The patient is bleeding. You gotta stop the bleeding. Now we need to look at, okay, where did we do well? Where did policy fall down? How do we do that on the short term and fix that? But also the longer term. And uh, I, I, do, I, I truly believe that um, we're looking at 24 months of planning to ensure that the economy remains whole. Small business has a fighting chance to not just live, but succeed. Um, and also um, from a health perspective, you know, we need to double down on the messaging that we have. Um, we need to ensure that the contact tracing is there. We, through the investment that we made last week, said that we are aiming for 200,000 tests per day in Canada. We got to maintain that. We got to ensure that it needs to happen because we are in, we are in a battle. You know, I won't be so Pollyannish to say we're in a war, but in essence, you know, we're fighting something that uh, is not going to go away tomorrow. And, it, and, it, and, it, and it's not going to go away in a month's time. So every aspect of the economy, every aspect of the social fabric, every aspect of education, uh, every aspect of, of the economy uh, is now under the microscope, not just six months down the road, but where are we going to be in, in 16 months down the road? And, and that's where our office has been, whether it's on the fishery or on um, the um, in, in infrastructure projects. Um, that uh, will hopefully be coming down the pipe soon once the um, once the province signs off on the changes to the bilateral that uh, Minister McKenna spoke to yesterday. So there's a lot happening, but it's all connected, and it's all connected because there's not one facet of this society that's been impacted uh, by COVID. But those are the kind of things that we're working on uh, that uh, consistently on my mind. I, you can't see it here. I won't. I won't turn my camera around. Uh, but I have copious amounts of stickies on, on the wall and the priorities that I talk to you about are there every day I walk in. Why? It's not because I'm going to forget, uh, but it's just, it just reinforces the fact that there's much to do. And, that, and it's not just us, right? I mean, we've got the provincial governments across the country and the territorial governments and the municipalities and the First Nations communities and advocacy groups throughout, throughout the, the, the country, uh, like in our Acadian communities that are um, pulling together and doing what we can to, uh, to inform strong policy and to change policy that's not working. I wanted to go back to uh, what you said about seniors and providing help sure. for them. Um, I've actually heard from several seniors in our community who've seen their old age pension uh, reduced. Now, cost of living has gone up. I verify with Statistics Canada, it says that it has gone up. Incomes have not, not gone up either. So is there an explanation, a possible explanation for that? Um, I I've talked to a few of them too. Uh, actually, and, so, and some of those cases, um, a few of those cases we've taken on uh, because there seem to be some um, uh, anomalies there. So we're working on those. In some cases, and, 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 and again, it's individualized, uh, a senior may have worked and that, that, that may see the impact on, on a deduction, but that's not uh, the cases that I'm referring to that have come through my office. Um, for example, um, there was a, one person who, who, who just called and said, I've got a reduction of a dollar. Like, how does that work, right? Like, she was just more curious than anything. And I thought, a dollar? And I said, you know what? We need to look at that because if there's a problem in the system um, or there's an oversight, we need to, to follow that up. So in some cases, it may be, and, and, and I would really encourage Paula that anybody that has any issues, um, if they've seen a decline, to, to reach out to our office so we can triage it appropriately because in some cases it could be a clerical error. In some cases it could be a, a, an issue with um, 
an accounting mistake, or in some cases, like in one case, we deduced in, just from the individual that there was a period of time that they worked. And, and so that played a role on, on, on a slight deduction. So we've, that was about two weeks ago. So we noticed that um, once, I think, well, yeah, probably the first week of July when the, when the payments start going out that people, some people had, had seen a deduction. So I think there's a couple, there's probably multiple reasons, but one of the things that I would say is please anybody out there through your platform, reach out to our office and we'll get a caseworker working with you immediately on it to ensure that we get the answers uh, that uh, will lead to the why. And if it needs to be changed to change it. And if it remains the same, why it's going to be remaining the same. So people know. Some cases they're not a dollar. My mother, if, if my mother's on a fixed income, so if my mother uh, was deducted $10, $5, may not seem like a lot to people, but it is a lot to anyone that's on a fixed income uh, that you basically, your budget is fixed. Your budget for food and everything is fixed. So absolutely. So if, you know, if the government of Canada owes a senior a cent, I want to get that cent back to them. It, 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 you know, if, if there's a mistake or there's um, um, an oversight or whatever the case may be. And if it's not, I want to know why. I, I, I want the senior to, and myself to know why so we can break it down. Because the only way to identify a problem is to, is to shine a light on it. And, and, that, and that's what we do here. So absolutely, Paula. A $10 is a big difference. $20 is, is, is a huge difference between, uh, you know, um, uh, five, six, seven items on a grocery order, which is critical for seniors. For anyone that's on a fixed income for that matter. So you would say people should contact you? 100%. Uh, call us, email us, we'll get back to you. Um, in my office now, I'm in my office now, I think this is the first time we've done this in my, uh, in my office. Um, I have uh, a staff that's working remotely and I have one or two that are here in another room. Uh, we're triaging cases. We haven't stopped. Uh, we, I think one of our interviews, we talked about, you know, you know, accumulation of a, about 200 calls and emails and texts and Facebook posts and Twitter posts a day. It really hasn't deviated that much uh, from, from that a little bit. Um, it's only been the past couple of weeks that we haven't been working six days a week. Um, so uh, we're here. This is our job. The seniors that are out there, this is our job, is to advocate, support, and find answers um, to, to, to either questions or oversight or whatever the case may be. So please call us. This is, this is why we're here. And uh, as someone who's worked a lot with seniors, and I have, um, I, back in the day, I established the first seniors college in Cape Breton. Um, I've gotten to, to work with some many great seniors. Uh, it's very important to me. Uh, so please reach out. Please reach out. If you have any issues on your check, we need to know. You can send us your questions for government officials at chne.television at gmail.com. Thanks for watching.